And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra. With me, I have two of my good brothers. We have the man with the biggest airship fetish in the entire temple. <laughs> And the and the man who's probably logged two thousand hours of in Titanfall two, good, <laughs> good brother Ash. Hi. We have the man of a thousand runes, the bane of my fucking existence, and the CEO of the Dari Enterprises. Good brother Xanatrix. Somebody's got to have that job. I can't let anybody else go unemployed because they can't stand up to you. <laughs> It, we, it is once again t that time of the week for us to enter the Valley of the Judged. The last time was, um, I'm not going to lie, a bit of a shit show. But we, but it was, our, it was our first go around with this particular approach. And fortunately, the, the episode that we have this week when it comes to the Valley of the Judged with the level up um, playtest is a little bit more concise. And that is that is because we are t we are tackling the first class based playtest document in this series involving e involving everyone's favorite meat shield slash argument about about how bo about how boring they are the fighter or as they were once known and the long long ago the feeder. <laughs> um, now, the f the fight the fighter has always had a bit of an unfortunate reputation. Whether it be whether it be the t whether it be um, in the old days where their where their one claim to fame was hey at this at at a few levels in you can be you can be a lord and get higher links so that you can do even more basic attacks. I'm I'm vast I'm vastly simplifying of course, but in the and in more in more modern incarnations we have the whole thing where where they were the only one to hang on to one of four e's good ideas and even then five e kind of screwed it up um large largely because of the fact that here's a here's a question that I don't think I got I don't think I got to dip into when we did the whole reconstructing classes thing for geek watch why why is why is it that um that something like something like second wind ha has to have absolutely no connection with hit dice you remember well, that well in 5e hit dice don't have much of a mechanical function beyond giving you back some hit points so it'd be it would be an odd exception to the rule is the only problem I think the I think the issue I the issue I have is that is that whole double dipping that I mentioned before. Um although to, although I'd say I'd say I'd say a bigger issue is the, is the fact that it's just 1d10 plus level and given how um given how eight HP increases are going to go with fighters that seems a bit flat. And but when but now when now of course there's the fact that the three subclasses that we have in a in five e um one of them is the gold standard of blandness one of them is a yeah. gish and the other one is the and the third one is the one that's actually interesting that being the battle master. Very true. So much so that I don't even remember the names of the other two subtypes. Um, champion and Eldritch Knight. 
Champion is just hey, let's make let's take the tanky guy and make him even more tanky. Oh no, he's a the champion is a crit fisher. Yeah. But and then Eldritch Knight. Is... Eldritch Knight is you get to cast shield, mage armor, and yeah, uh, yeah. El Eldritch, and know, Eldritch Knight is just another attempt to splash magic in without any multi-classing. Which if and done quite poorly. Okay, let okay, let me ask you this. Do you think something like Eldritch Eldritch Knight would be slightly less shitty if it weren't for the weren't for so many spells requiring a concentration rule? No, it would still be shitty because of the action. That's one of the few areas in which it concentration or no, the concentration isn't as offensive when it comes to the Eldritch Knight. Because generally speaking, you're using your action for so many other things that you already have a pretty limited slot of spells that you're actually going to be attaching. And they're generally something that, all right, they do something when you cast them, and then you can manipulate it in some way using specifically a bonus action on consequent on subsequent turns. Mm -hmm. Like, like uh, s Flaming Sphere. Yeah. But I believe that's a conjuration, so they might not have access. No, I think they could have access to it. They would just need to make sure that uh, their other their other spell stone would be filled up with something from the ab abjuration evocation spells. No, no. The issue for Eldritch Knight is the action economy, yeah, and how casting a spell interferes in a very prohibitive fashion with, with making an attack. Economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas something like Battlemaster, even though even if it's give, first off, it's it's even if it is a neutered version of what it was in the playtest, it is still the superiority die are still are still a chip off the old block when it comes when it came to the original maneuver die idea. It's the maneuver die was one of was, I know I've mentioned it many times over the years, but that was the one really good idea from the five E playtest that did that didn't make it completely through because. Originally, that die system was for all the martial classes, not just the fighter. Um, as a bit, which um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this when we did the four when we did the four E um thing, but I consider Second Wind for fighters a case of missing the point compared to um. Set compared to second win back and forth. I think you did briefly cover it when we did the Geek Watch. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I... I can see where you're coming from there. I really can. Oh. So how does second win work in fourth edition? Um, we should start there for making the reference. Do you remember... Do you remember... Do you remember the way, he, the way healing surges worked in fourth? Uh, vaguely. Um, I never had to use them. When you spend a he when you spend a healing surge, either either through second wind or so or through an effect, you recover one fourth of your maximum. Mm. Second wind is an encounter power that everybody has, where they can spend one healing surge, and grant and grant themselves a one turn bo boost to all defenses. So fortitude, fortitude, ref, um, reflex, will, and AC. Okay. And at the same time, since second wind was used, they'd also be able to at, uh, uh, spend that healing surge for the healing at the same time. So you, it was basically mm -hmm. a stand, uh, stand up and defend yourself for a moment while you're catching your breath, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And. So and of course, certain. Um, of course, um, it got it got a lot more interesting for a lot of for a lot of classes once they once they reach Paragon tier because a bit a bit of a un, a bit of a pattern when it came to Paragon um, paths in 4E was adding extra effects to Second Wind or when you spent or when you take an extra action using a uh, action point. But the but for five E first first off the whole once per short rest which I believe we made clear a week ago why that why that particular format um kind of sucks. 
kinda. <laughs> Being generous there, I see. But the the other the other factor is I on I honest I honestly think that I honest the idea of D ten plus level has never really it feels it feels like the sole reason it was it was done at that amount is simply so it didn't um outstrip other sources of healing. I can see that. That's a fine explanation. <laughs> which if that which... So comparing the two different second wins, it's it's pretty clear. I don't think it's that 5e missed the point so much as they weren't trying to replicate the 4th edition effect. Which... And it, it, intentionally so, not out of any kind of like, oh, well, we just screwed up and somehow made it exclusive to this one class and then made it less effective. It's No, this this fits in with 5e's adjustments to things. I think it, I think it remains internally consistent because it's not a high value. But it is something, something that's pretty common in 5th edition, I think that they anticipated this, is that oftentimes you'll go down and then somebody will just spend a few hit points in order to actually get you back up. A first level cure wounds, a regular healing potion, things of that sort, which are probably going to net you, at best, uh, double digit health, which is, which is not going to be impressive, something in the teens at best, basically. And it's not necessarily even going to keep you up for one more hit, but if you pop your second wind on your subsequent turn, then all of a sudden your pool of available hit points now equals something that could approximate taking an additional hit or suffering an additional spell effect or any kind of area of effect attack. Which is actually quite thematically. There's a nice little bit of thematic play in between the mechanical play. There is you're taking your second wind after having been beaten unconscious. Which is a fun yeah, it's it's a fun little interplay there. So I think it just serves a different function. If that if that's the case, then they then they should have made that clear that that would be a more effective use of it. I mean, should they? You'd use it whenever you want. I don't think anything in fifth edition comes with a warning label about when the best time to use it is. Yeah. No, you're no. You're just supposed to. You're just supposed to un understand this kind of thing by um, by ma by magic somehow. Um, Trial and error. I think it's more like. And. Com and um, compared to, com compared to other f com and compared to certain other features, it's um. I'd say I'd say I'd say sec second wind is is um is marginally useful compared compared to say um action surge. Yeah. Um, Considering what action surge actually does. Yeah. But when it comes to the when it comes to the play, the um level up 5e um fighter um it's worth noting that in that within this document they talked about addressing three issues that people said in, in the sur in a, in a survey at the time were important those three were meaningful character choices at each advancement level a fully fleshed out exploration pillar and a range of martial maneuvers to give non-spellcasters more options in combat. Which I've seen I've seen some I've seen some people argue against the against the whole options things because it it would either A overwhelm or B take a basic class in and um make it le and make it less basic. Um I've had I've always had a bit of an issue with the idea of labeling some classes as basic and other classes as more advanced. Not in terms of the whole base class or prestige classes or something like that, but more in terms of ha of 
having 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 some be be designed to be be designed to be simple by default cuz well we've se we've seen the meme of of standard fighters over, over the years you know the i the uh, stereotype that playing as fighters are for those who um who don't want to do a whole lot of thinking during encounters yeah, I find that stereotype to be massively uh, incorrect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, in some cases, it's being it's being put forward by ca by caster ca players who don't want anybody encroaching on their territory. Looking at you every gro every grog during <laughs> during tome of battle, but when it when it comes to, and speaking of that, it's very clear to me that that was that that was one of the in, that was one of the inspirations that they had because the whole maneuvers thing and degrees of maneuvers and the fact that they're all subtyped into different st into different styles that is so <laughs> that is so Toma battle it hurts. <laughs> Now, granted, in this document, first off, we we only go to we only go to ten levels, but um, there were there were a couple of things that in this that I find very interesting. Um, one of them is the exploration knack. You know this this idea this idea that you um, it's a it's, I guess the the best way for me to see it is give is giving extra tricks that could be used outside of combat. Almost leaning a little bit into some skill monkeyness, but not really. Like we're not going full on rogue, but we'll probably end up covering the rogue later in later in this series. And but extra utility Yeah. Um in general. You have this now, with the exploration knacks and with um martial lore. Yeah. Well and Extra utility isn't always a bad thing. The, the, the ability for any class to involve itself more within the game, whether it's in battle or not, is, in my opinion, a good attempt. Mm -hmm. How it's executed determines whether it was a, an actu a good result. But the... the, the mindset of involve a class in more intrinsically within the game uh within within its own bailiwick is a is a laudable uh goal mm -hmm. that said when it comes to because of because of the whole thing with maneuvers um since th since it's still using the whole idea of martial archetypes starting at third level, um, I fear for somebody who who's taking this and go and is going to try and um, do a do a bat do a level up fighter and um, battle master. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes when it comes to now, first off, when it comes to the diff the combat traditions that are that are brought up, one little thing that I thought was a very interesting um, motif that they went with is for each of the each of the um, traditions, they had l they had little um, little tags right on un right under their titles in um I in mm -hmm. italic. And I think what I like about this is that it's is that it's a quick way to get kind of the general feel for what one would expect from those traditions. Yeah, you're easing the player into things. I mean, this goes back to the basic character discussion. Is that generally I think the problem with basic characters is you are forcing you are setting a baseline for what other people in the party are allowed to play based on the lowest common denominator of person that's going to enter, it that can sound dismissive. And and frankly, it is. Because if you come to the table and you're going to demand that everybody else play something simple, or everybody be presented in a simple fashion for you, and, and 
sort of screw with everybody else's fun as a result. Uh, there's room for derogatory statements about those sorts of people. But in this instance, the designers would have been able to point to their design and say, hey, we're giving you basically quick start guidelines. Mm -hmm. We're telling you, if you're looking for a specific character, you know, you don't have to research everything. If you just want to know where to go, you don't care about min-maxing. You just want to know where where to go to grab whatever it is that you think this character is going to be. Head right over here, and you can get you can get away with it. And it's fine. The reason I yeah. focus on this is, as you as some of you know, I have been very adamant about about put about putting in some 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 setup of guide or su or suggestion so so that you have less instances of swim damn it yeah and um i th i think the point ash made was that how that's implemented can be either in a more oppressive way or in a more uh assistive way and he's and uh if correct me if i'm wrong ash you were saying that the way they did it here with the level up project uh it's a it's a form of assistance it says you don't have to do all the background stuff that the that the people who really want to dig in want to do if you don't need to so here's the way to do it quick mm -hmm. right okay i i, I yeah which I, is the advantage of grouping them in this fashion yes i agree now one little sidebar that they put into the document that's not necessarily related to the class, but is related to core mechanics, and I'm guessing this is something that they're going, that they're going to be tooling with in the final book, just not in, just not in the fighter section, obviously, is the idea of um, of minor advantage and disadvantage. Now, advantage and disadvantage, we already know how that works, and. Um, to be on, to, if I'm being quite honest, I've always found that to be a bit swingy compared to the whole boon and bane setup that's in Shadow of the Demon Lord. But for the, but for the, but the way that the way that it works with my, with the minor version of it, it says when you have minor advantage, if the result of your D20 roll is five or lower, you can roll a second D20 and use the higher of the two. Same same thing applies for a minor disadvantage if your roll is sixteen or higher. And if you've got and a double stack of minor advantage is just treated as advantage. Um, this does kind of this does kind of lead a little bit into the um the flexible attacks that were that were in thirteenth age. But what was your take on that? What was your guys' take on that particular mechanic? On flexible attacks or minor advantage and disadvantage? Minor advantage and disadvantage. Um. Just give me a plus two, minus two. I am not interested in prolonging the resolution phase of any given action. Yeah, uh, especially since it's it's a uh, if you have minor disadvantage and roll above a certain already high number, then you have to roll a second dice and take a take the lower of the two. That it, There's so many qualifiers compared to even just normal advantage and disadvantage that it's a that it's a little little quirky. Yeah. It's not as straightforward as it could be, and mm -hmm. that's just going to, as Ash pointed out, uh, it prolong resolution. For potentially identical results is another qualifier I should add on to this. I think a, it's a the difference the the difference between the disadvantage and the minor disadvantage. If you take two d twenty rolls, you're going to have to I, one of these you have to put through the minor dif disadvantage mechanic. The other you have to put through the disadvantage mechanic. The rolls are going to oftentimes come out to be quite similar. Yes. To be qu to be so, quite honest, I think. I think this whole this whole minor and full thing might have worked a little bit more interesting if you slightly if you slightly tweaked it and re and reversed it. The idea being the standard approach to that would just be um that that gets switched over to minor whereas the fu the full on advantage or disadvantage 
would ha would have it that if you can would kind of take a kind of take a um and this in this hypothetical and this is probably how I'd house rule it um have it that if that if you make a roll with advantage you cannot roll lower than 10 if you roll lower than 10 it's treated as a 10 and when it comes to disadvantage you can't roll hot you can't roll higher than a 10 which is in of itself not a problem the it just goes back to the issue that i was just mentioning where the difference between these two gradations of mechanics are so thin so small that the benefit that you're gaining for if any benefit at all that you are gaining for engaging with these two separate mechanics it, if if you get any whatsoever it's going to be again very very small so the question is going to be at the table why are we wasting time on this? Let's just toss it out. And this is something that Watsi has continued to struggle with. The is what TSR continued to struggle with is they would include, it's like, oh, well, we're using a different resolution mechanic for these two different success, for these two different modifiers on success and failure. And therefore, it's going to be, because they're different, people are going to appreciate them. It's like, no, no, sorry. You're adding another fiddly bit for, again, what could be, and what often come out to be a an identical result or identical process of resolution so people are the first thing that people are going to do is they're going to look at it and say these two things are the same thing so we're not going to slow down the game with it and we're tossing it out the the um i think the i think the reason i was leaning to, leaning towards that approach is the is the idea of using um using it as a as a parachute the argument that i just i can't remember if this was on the old on the old forums or elsewhere but an argument that i've heard when it comes to advantage and disadvantage is that it was brought in be to let to ease the burden of so many um so many plus two modifiers from different sources but modifiers are straightforward Yes, you can get a bunch of modifiers from different sources, but so long as you're tracking your modifiers, there's no question. You roll the dice, you add the numbers up, you've got your resolution. I think the, I think the 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 oh, so many modifiers, too much burden is is it's a it's a it's the, what's the best logical fallacy here? Non issue. <laughs> that yeah. Well, the, it, I understand why people get upset with the modifiers thing. It's because it looks, one, it looks daunting insofar as a lot of these have durations and they have different durations. And so you'll be examining them and, and some of them are going to, at any point in the combat where one of these durations ends and you forgot, then you have to say, oh no, I got a 34 instead of a 36. People at the table freeze for a moment before they realize that the sequence of battle has not changed. You know, it, the 34 would have hit anyways. It didn't yeah. matter that it was 34 instead of a 36. But the time it took to stop, question, examine, and remember, and maybe somebody gets it wrong, because now if you have six different modifiers on the same attack, you're now providing six different opportunities for at least one person to get something wrong or have to defend it, and this kind of slows the game down. I think modifiers are valuable. I've been looking at them for uh, Lords of Brachus because, I, I mean, hell, I'm using card mechanics. And you could have plenty of modifiers onto a Magic the Gathering thing, provided you have the physical counters. And it's very easy to track, but it's worth examining why people were complaining about them. It, like the real reason why people were complaining about them, because chances are they're not going to be able to adequately explain it. I don't think people have issues adding up plus one, plus two, plus three into a total of plus six on top of my attack, which was plus nine. This gives me a result of 25 to hit. I don't think that's where the issue comes in. I think it comes in with all of the interrupts and resolutions and examining of whether or not somebody got something wrong and the increased mental space it takes to go down the list, 
track the track the different durations, track the different sources, see if there's any exceptions to the rule that were that were missed. And this this increases the cognitive load and the kind of overhead on the game. I, and for I that can... purpose, advantage disadvantage is perfectly fine to to get rid of things. But it doesn't hurt to have a plus two or plus three in there every once in a while. It's, it sounds, or indeed, at all, please. Would it be fair of me to say that your issues, the idea of, of advantage, disadvantage, um, essentially tr essentially replacing um, static modifiers? Wait, who me? Yeah, that's that sound. That sounds like what what you're shooting for. This that it that you you're not fond of the fact that that advantage and disadvantage ends up getting you ends up getting used in lieu of a static mod no i'm relatively fine with it i prefer the advantage disadvantage i prefer it to swing in that direction as opposed to the other direction my issue was the inclusion of minor advantage and minor disadvantage mm -hmm. um which were mechanics which could be replaced by a minus two or a plus two respectively yeah. um although when although um Something something that I do that I do find interesting is I decided to see where um where minor advantage and where minor advantage is utilized in the um in the maneuvers most of them are in are in low level manu low level maneuvers and usually they end up being um used in stances in fact, every every tradition seems to have one seems to have one stance or action that gr that um gr that grants it in some w in some way, at least at least with um first degree ones. Which, incidentally, this might be a minor thing, but I like the fact that the levels of maneuvers are referred to as degrees and not well levels. It always drives me up a wall when it's the case of, okay, is this character level or is this spell level when it's talking about first, second, third, or, or whatever. Um, I pr I honestly prefer having having the two nomenclatures um separate. Um, legend system does. I didn't actually know that about you. That's kind of funny. Um, it's now granted. Now granted, it's not as be it's. I had I remember having this issue a lot when it whenever levels were brought up back with um third and pathfinder because it was the question of are we talking le are we talking level overall level in a particular cla in a particular class or a particular s prestige class you know how this goes or and then you bring in level of spell or uh, or other effect I'd ra I'd rather that level just refers to character level Full stop. That's so funny. That guy actually showed something about that in the prelude to AD and D, and lamented the fact that he had ba basically uh, lost the battle in that regard. Because most people are—I mean, most people are fine with it. <laughs> but no, that's that's an interesting little quirk. I can understand why some why some people are fine with it, and at this point, I'm old man yells at cloud with it because it's been grandfathered mm -hmm. in. But I pref but I much pref in a lot of my own work outs outside of it. I much prefer having some alt having some alternative um, term whenever you have t whenever you have um, tiers of effect lists that aren't related to character level. Um, I mentioned legend system for as an example. The um, all the class features and all the tracks for that um, are referred to as circle, first through seventh circle. Um, and granted, they fall into the spell level trap as well, but it's somewhat understandable because again, old habits die hard. Um, and ev even even thirteenth age falls for this trap. Falls for this trap. Um. Well, it's not necessarily a trap. It's a, as far as I can tell, a, yeah, Gary's dead now, so I suppose it's something of a unique preference on your part. I suppose. Now, when it comes to... 
When it com now, when it comes to the the meth the method of um of res of um putting restrictions when on combat maneuvers. Now, of course, we of course we have the fact that it's that they're either um st they're either stances or techniques, which is str again that's straight out of um, Tome of Battle. But one th but one thing that I W that I'm cu that I'm curious on on you guys' take is the idea that that you're using essentially spell points with with this particular setup. Um, it's just that these spell points are based on your based on your um your exert your profi your uh, proficiency bonus plus the modifiers that are gr that are granted at certain levels. Um, is I remember with to I remember when this system was brought up in Tome of Battle, um, a lot of most of the most of, you had a certain number of maneuvers that you could you, that you could use or prepare, and they were all essentially encounter powers. Um, but with exertion, we have a num we have a number of spell points, and maneuvers have don't exactly have the same co don't exactly have the same cost in terms of the degree doesn't doesn't tie to the um, cost so what's your take on that particular economy all right you asked a few different questions there so the yeah. first thing i'll start off with is the fact that i have not engaged with third edition thank god or any of these earlier, any of these earlier kinds of assumptions about, like, you know, that you mentioned these being basically spell points. Coming into this from a fully new school perspective, these are just these are just resource counters. Yeah. Generally speaking, they're they're meant to represent general additional exertion mm -hmm. that you can manage without reliably screwing something up, or almost reliably so screwing something up. This is the number of times you can yeah. get away with something. Um, no, I so in that regard, it's it's standard. Yeah. With regards to not tying degrees to given points, I think that's generally speaking smart. There are a lot of different... One thing that a lot of people struggle with when it comes to designing different... I almost said supernatural effects. And this does apply to supernatural effects. <laughs> But really, any given effect is when you have multiple give it, multiple iterations and multiple different flavors of a nearly identical or singular kind of like central effect. Designers are not sure what to do to make sure that the more powerful effect in some way costs more than the not more powerful then the less powerful iteration of that central focus or theme. For instance, polymorphing the enemy into a newt is pretty powerful. Polymorphing yourself into an Allosaurus or T-Rex is, generally speaking, more powerful. And it's difficult to... The, the more you get into the weeds and try to split hairs over whether or not this effect can be tied to this other effect, which is generally speaking less powerful on in a kind of like blanket assumption kind of way it gets very difficult to it gets very difficult to balance against each other and it's difficult to balance okay resource expenditure as compared to mechanical overhead for splitting you know polymorph other versus poly polymorph self do we split these apart or do we just include these in the same spell versus cognitive overhead how many spells are people going to be keeping in their in their real heads, and so far as what they can remember, and the different restrictions that might be included, and in these other things? Well, if we have polymorph other and polymorph self, and these two spells are basically identical, except in you know same range, same casting time, same duration, except it's just one targets herself and one targets the other. It's like, well, isn't that just the same spell? Can we justify splitting these up? There's all these questions that designers tend to get really mired in. And if you just separating them by degree here and then not worrying as to whether or not the point cost is tied to the degree, these two things are disconnected. 
I think was a smart idea. Yeah. the The main thing that I'm going going into because um now let now let's be fair. Spe- um, spell points were. I'm using spell points just as a matter of habit. Um, but they but there was the option brought up in fifth edition regarding spell points, although um. Truth be told, I don't see people using it all that much. <laughs> and no, Vancey and magic habits die hard, apparently. Well, for me, for me, the um, the issue, the the issue with ha- with because the the approach that the approach that they end up trying to take is okay. Take all of the take all the all the Vancey and spell slots, combine them into one, and that's how many spell points you have. Um, and, and while at the same time having it that a, um, spe- that a spell costs the number of spell points equal to its level. Um, I can see that ca- that's the kind of thing where I've, where I've always said that could potentially work if you're dealing with low magic settings where somebody isn't going to be casting spells left and right. Mm-hmm. Um. But the pr- the problem is it's a it's a trying to do that sort of unified that sort of unified approach doesn't quite work when you're st- when you um when you haven't really considered the implications of it like the bit it would only it would only really work if you had it that every spell costs one costs one point. And honestly, that's what I—that's what I do in fantasy craft. Simply because the the real challenge is going to be doing the role itself. You don't need you don't need to punish people twice. Yeah, they're already get, they're already gonna have to do a spell cra- They're gonna have to do a spell casting check just to cast the thing. Let al- let alone let alone spending the po- There's no need reason to punish them by making them spend more points without the get. When they still don't have the guarantee that they're gonna actually cast the damn thing, unless you're unless you're going for some of the mods to spell casting, which in fantasy craft you can certainly do. But when it comes to the when it comes to the exertion pool, what I'm specifically referring to is even in first degree, certain effects co- cost one point and certain effects cost two. Um, And he, and I could I don't know about you, but I could see this being an being an issue when it comes to how how do you um, determine what's going what's going to justify costing two points. So I guess we would have to take two of the first level powers and compare, or first level maneuvers, excuse me, and compare them to to each other one that does cost one and one that does cost two that are and see why what what logic we can come up with at that point well let's uh, let's use two from at from the adamant mountain tradition um lean into it costs one point which is a technique that does an extra 1d4 damage whenever you hit with a weapon attack that has the heavy property until the start okay. of your next turn Okay. And Mountain's Might cost two points is a bonus action where you regain hit points equal to one d six plus your proficiency bonus plus your con mod. Okay. So I'm I'm looking here at the at the other three ad, all three of the Adamant Mountain uh, first degree maneuvers that are one point. Um, all of them require that you're using a weapon with the heavy property, mm-hmm. uh, which is a restriction. Whereas Mountain's Might has no restriction other than, as a bonus action, do this. Uh, whereas Heavy Swing is a reaction, so it's got it's technically got two limitations on it. It's a reaction, and you can only do it when you have something with it with heavy. You have a third there, which is that you have to have minor disadvantage on this attack. Yeah, which again, just make that a minus two. Mm-hmm. Just so, so it's got three restrictions on it, and it's, uh, it, it's an additional attack, sure, but it's an additional attack with 
heavy restrictions. Um, whereas, again, Mountain's Might is just bonus action, you get HP. You, at, the very, at the very minimum, even if you have a negative con mod, it tells you that it's still minimum zero on con mod. So at the very minimum, you're getting three HP back, period. One, one from a 1d6 and your plus two proficiency bonus at, at, in the first four levels. Um, but because it does have a die roll in there, you could potentially get anywhere from eight to 12 HP back if your con mod is four and you roll a six. Uh, <clears throat> so I can understand why Mountains might would, would be of a higher cost. There's less restrictions. And even though it, there's a die roll involved to add some RNG, it's still going to be nothing but advantage in the end. You're going to use a bonus action to gain back an amount of HP that is going to be more than three, let's be honest. Most uh, most fighters are going to have a con mod of at least plus one or plus two. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're going to see... Uh, what would the mean on that be there, Ash? About, about, a, about a seven, then? About a Roughly seven. speaking, seven or eight. Yeah, about a, about a seven HP regain for two points. And that's your bonus action. In lower levels, that's a lifesaver. That is literally a lifesaver. Um, so I, I, I can see why the point difference exists. Yeah, uh, this is what goes back to the point I made earlier, where you <laughs> designers have trouble evaluating these different abilities, which are clearly on different power scales, but they don't know in what way they're going to they're going to split hairs. Now, if you were to pump these, if you were to pump these different abilities into matrices that we have in front of us, you could put the you could pop them in the matrix, in the matrix. Sorry, and you could say, all right, this column A is going to be whatever the me mechanical hook is. We might say that attacking with the heavy property isn't necessarily a restriction so much as that's the mechanical hook. Because you you could probably apply that to any given weapon. There probably is a, a feature like that for any given weapon. Treat every any weapon as a, as, a, as if it were heavy? Yeah, probably. No, 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 no. I mean like a... Um, so there's going to be a version of heavy swing for thrown weapons and a version of heavy swing for ranged weapons oh, and etc yeah, yeah, etc yeah okay so I we're going to tie that into mechanical that's going to be a mechanical hook column okay and then we have the action column in which we say all right reactions are a little bit more are a little bit more favorable but not too favorable because they're because you might need that reaction for something else you might much rather have that reaction for something else especially since we're including other features here. If for nothing else, we're including other man maneuvers here, which function off your reaction. So yeah. you're still going to be, it's not, it's not for free, necessarily. Yeah. You're still giving yeah. something else up because we assume that is part of the game. Mm -hmm. Then we have restrictions. Minor disadvantage. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be, can't stack it against the same creature. That could be a mechanical hook. That could be a that could be a restriction. It's it's on that line there. Yeah. So we uh, when we stack all those up, we attach we could potentially, if we really wanted to, attach number values to those. And this is what I often do with spell research mechanics. And this is often how I how I'll met, sort of mentally organize these things. Very rarely do it on paper, but I do, my goodness, I have a whiteboard for that purpose, so I can if I want to. Uh, I will I will take different features and I will sort of attach number values to them. So we could say reaction is a zero because it's not for free, but it's still pretty attractive. So that's going to be zero. Weapon with the heavy property, we're not going to attach any kind of number value to our to our mechanical hook uh, against the second creature. We might say that's like a minus one. Because in it has term, to have a second creature within attack range for it to work. Right. And then minus, minor disadvantage, that would be another minus one. So because we're at like minus two, but this is an extra thing that you get to spend on your exertion point, we're going to say that this cat this is going to cost one point to actually create. And the sort of final arbiter, once you stack these different numbers of, of traits 
on top of each other, evaluating the mechanical hook, evaluating the any additional restrictions that you might have, minor disadvantage or major disadvantage or whatever have you, stacking all of those up and then saying, all right, we're going to, the point cost is going to be the final arbiter of this. But also you have the fact, you have the function of, sorry, this one last thing here. What level do you get this at? Mm-hmm. First, You could get heavy swing at first level if you want. Mm-hmm. So we're going to say that's plus one. And as we, as we come to the end here, we find that we have uh, balanced our checkbooks and we come up to a total of zero. When we come up to, you know, you could get this at first level. That's plus one. It only it costs, only costs one, point. one point. Plus one, yeah. And then you have two disadvantages, two, two restrictions on this feature. And we're going to evaluate those at about a minus one, roughly speaking. And we come out to a total of zero, and that's... I mean, you could you could put all of these abilities into a matrix. Yeah. Like this. Whereas with Mountain's, Mountain's Might, the only restriction is bonus action, which is a little more costly than a reaction, so that would be a minus one. Rather well, I would say that that's even better than a... Because uh, you get to use it, basically. You get to use it on your turn, and you get to access healing without screwing up your action. So I would put, like, bonus action at plus one. You know? Still sacrificing a, a, a bonus action for something that could be used again uh, for something else. That again, you're getting there are bonus action uh, maneuvers in this first degree that could be used as well elsewhere. Right, but the point at which you're giving, trying to give yourself an additional, on average, eight healing, mm-hmm. that's that's inflating the the cost of this or inflating the value of this. That goes back to our earlier discussion of second wind. When are you going to be using this thing? Somebody else, I was at zero. Somebody else gave me a little bit of, you know, a little bit of HP. I still can't take a hit, but I have this thing in my back pocket, which will allow me to take another hit. And so the, the value is sort of artificially inflated in its appropriate use. And as we mentioned, you're, you're able to get back this free HP thing which can potentially heal you to full at early levels, and you have access to it at early levels as a bonus action. Mm-hmm. This is one okay. of those opportunities where you don't have that many attacks to begin with, so evaluating when you get this thing, I think the point cost actually makes a lot of sense. And the bonus oh, action is a benefit rather than a detriment, because it would certainly suck if it cost your action. And then you'd, you'd probably see the cost come back down if it cost your full action. Right. All right. I, I, I see why you're evaluating bonus action that way. Thank, thanks for the, the insight there. Um, that's, and, and that's very specific to the fact that you're getting this at early levels and when you're when you're accessing this. Yeah. At higher levels, I think I'd much rather have one of those maneuvers that costs a bonus action than using Mountain's Might. Yeah. And and at that point, but, but since this is a first degree combat maneuver that is accessible at first level. That's that's where the, the final weight for bonus action comes into. I get it. Exactly. It's, it's, it's conditional. Um, and, and then, of course, for, for those, we, we could, as, as you said, we could take every one of these and plug it into a matrix. But if we did that, we'd be here, you know, for the next week. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just a, a good example to give. But right. That's actually one of the ones I had highlighted on my on my PDF here. I see. Well, it's a good thing that we started talking about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. But in the end, your your weighted matrix uh, is a, is a great visual. I, I, if anybody were to draw it up, visual arbiter of why these particular uh, point values are assigned. And whereas uh, for people for people who are who are less um structured i guess is the best way to put it or people who may have less experience with that type of waiting mm-hmm. um it still has a an intuitive spark to it as to why this costs more than that you right. can take a pretty you can take a pretty good look at at any of these particular maneuvers that we're seeing in first degree uh and you'll notice that most of them are one point in fact 
if I if I think if I think about it here, looking at just the first degree maneuvers, I'm struggling to. There's one which costs two points, and I've actually outlined it in red for I think it sucks. W wounding strike from the unending wheel. Yep, I think that's the only other one that costs two points. It, it is in in first in first degree. That is the uh, only other one, and uh, you before you that? wait before you wait it, uh, I'm going to read through it and i'm going to give my intuitive spark as to why you might think it sucks mm -hmm. i'll probably think it sucks too to be honest if that's let, the case let me read let me read this one off um okay although before i before i do i want to see what the the theme for unending wheel it the themes are mastery patience and training um i'd say it i'd say it's i'd say it the way they describe it, it kind of feels like the, um, the i the um was I believe it was it was either Iron or Steel Dragon style in um Tome of Battle, um, but so I, I want you to take I want you to keep that in mind with the with part of the question of whether or not a something like that would fit within Unending Wheels um theme, but Wounding Strike two points. Bonus action. Choose a weapon when you learn this combat maneuver. When you use the chosen weapon and hit with your next attack roll against a living creature, you deliver a wound. At the start of each of the wounded creature's turns, it takes 1d4 damage of the same type dealt by your weapon, and it can then make a constitution save, ending the effect on itself on a success. Alternatively, the wounded creature, or a creature within 5 feet of it, can use an action to make a DC 15 medicine check, ending the effect of such wounds on it as a success. Healing magically or from a trait such as regeneration also ends the effect. Um I have I have a bit of a guess as to your problem with as to your problem with it. But I can I can see I, I can see a couple problems. One, the whole the whole choose a weapon thing is a bit is a bit of a excess when it comes to Especially since it doesn't say choose a weapon type, it says choose a weapon. That might be a little bit too specific. Um, My, well, it, well, the the real question is: is it do, does it mean specifically just that one chosen longsword yeah, out believe, of all other longswords that you've ever had? Oh, no, that would be that would be that would be all longswords. If you said longsword, that would just be longswords. Yeah, um, the in theme, line with. Some people might get confused by that, but that would get quickly resolved with either sage advice or a ruling at the table. I think very few GMs would. Oh yeah, the theme I'm, I'm... with unending wheel, from the way it's described in the PDF, is that of the weapon master trope. The sort, the whether it be whether it be the uh, the master the master swordsman the the can say that kind of thing. That I think is what right. the it's what it's attempts. Thing to uh, go with yeah but a a true weapon master goes beyond the weapon they are holding they realize that all weapons are an extension of the self and thus any weapon within the hands of a weapon master is extremely deadly yeah well that's uh, that's not really the flavor it's that you're making you're maximizing the advantages of these different weapons i, I if i'm I holding a quarter staff i'm not going to hold it with I, I might hold it with two hands, but I'm not going to be holding it in the middle of the in the middle of the staff. I'm going to keep my distance, and I'm going to smack people with because uh, I'm holding one end of it. And I'm using the other hand to bonk people, rather than trying to get as close as possible and minimize my both my effective reach and how much kinetic force I can put into the blow. That's well, kind of the that's the idea. Well, the you're taking these different weapons and you're maximizing because these do have different strengths, yeah. definitely. A dagger does not have the same strengths as the longsword, and it fits in a little bit with the history of D of D and D. Even though this, you know, this isn't D and D, whatever. Uh, if it, it fits in with the history of you know specific weapon and to hit specific AC charts, mm -hmm. but I a little more positive iteration of it. Yeah, from from an intuitive stance, I can see why this maneuver sucks <laughs> um restricted to a specific weapon uh the fact that the wounding damage uh is at the start of the creature's turns 
and can be thrown off by a saving throw, a medicine check, or any sort of regeneration or healing. Which means if you're dealing with something like trolls, this thing is going to be pointless. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, you're, you're dealing with trolls at level one. There's a bro bit of a problem there. Oh. Um, <laughs> Random counter suck it. Uh, I know. But the... But I'm getting. I'm... So the, I have two issues with this. Let's let's start with the one that isn't the Matrix, because I'll be able to run through that quickly. All right. And then we'll all run it through the Matrix per se and see if we could uh, tinker with it. So it ends on a Constitution saving throw. This is something that somebody can proc many times, and the person is going to constantly be asking, "Hey, can you make me a Constitution saving throw?" I have. This is very rare in Fifth Edition nowadays. With the exception of it, just looking at the base game, uh, the weapon of wounding, which is a which is a magical weapon, which produces this effect. The person has to make a con save or suffer the uh, or suffer the d4 of damage. This, as far as I can tell, the description for that particular magic weapon was ported directly from this. And I actually had one of those weapons in my first campaign. It was very frustrating. I actually stopped asking my dungeon master to make me con saves because it slowed down the uh, slowed down the combat so much, and it was just so annoying for the both of us. I just stopped asking him about it. And why not? It's only a D four. <laughs> you know, I much rather get get back to. I will give up the average two to three damage to in order to actually get back to the you know get to my turn my next turn faster in which I'm actually going to do something effective. Yeah. The so that's the first problem is all of this text here, you should just be able to say one first off, DC fifteen medicine check ends. Right? Mm -hmm. they, you don't need all this text. Or better yet, in the text for a medicine check, it's just generally understood that medicine checks or the heal skill or whatever can end ongoing damage. And you can make ongoing damage a condition. As it was in 4th edition, it was extremely easy to and quick to resolve. Mm -hmm. And so that's that all that still all that text is superfluous and it slows down the game. And you could you could shorten this down to basically the first action, which is bonus action. Choose a weapon when you learn this combat maneuver. When you use the chosen weapon and hit with your next attack roll against a living creature. You deliver a wound. At the start of each of the creature's turns, takes 1d4 damage. Of the same type dealt by your weapon, con save ends, etc. Right? Now we can put this through the mate. So this is just poorly designed to begin with because it's going to slow the shit out of the game. And I was kind of annoyed to see that pop up again in Tasha's because I'm actually playing a character which now has a make a saving throw for me, please, uh, feature that I that I enjoy using quite often. It's one of a spread of features, so they were able to get away. If we were to plug that feature into the Matrix, that it, we would be able to get away with its design, but we're not going to do that right now. Let's plug Wounding Strike into the Matrix. Cost two points, bonus action, restricted by a chosen weapon. Uh, has to be has to be procced with an attack roll. That's not too bad. Has to be against a living creature. Still not too bad. I'd consider both of those zeros because they're the, those are I think those are the mechanic hooks at those point. Mechanical hooks. I, I'm inclined to agree. Yeah. And at the start of each of the creatures wounded turns, it takes one d4 damage. That's a minus one in my opinion. Yeah, it's not enough damage. It's a, you're right. It's it's not enough damage because you could be using something else. You could be you could be getting your health back with a uh, mountain strength or whatever it is. Or if, or if, or if That's you're staying, funny. yeah. If you're staying in just one wheelhouse, <laughs> that was not intentional. I, I <laughs> but in unending wheel, you have dangerous signature, which is literally I am Zorro. Um, but it's it's only one point, and if you put your signature on something when you hit it, you have advantage on insight and intimidation checks against it, which can be useful in certain situations. Yeah. Or you can. Train swings is really good. Just deal an extra D four. Mm -hmm. Provided exactly. that you don't have any kind of disadvantage on you. Yeah, you you could literally trade Wounding Strike for Trained Swings, and you're still getting ostensibly the same effect, except there's no con save to throw it off. And It costs one less point. It costs one less point. And you could and be making more than one attack in a given round, so you're proccing it more often. 
Yes. It's 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 yeah. at every point a better maneuver. Yeah. Now for me personally the the big issue that the big issue that I have with the, with this kind of maneuver is for all intents and purposes you're 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 trying to create a whole new, you're trying to create a whole new mechanic with wounding in this manner. When D&D has never really been comfortable with a wounding system. The only, there are, there are a couple ways I could possibly I could possibly see this being more interesting. One, temporary con damage. Yeah, temp um temp con, temp con damage, that's one, that's one way to do it. Another way and I'm pretty sure I, I'm pretty sure I'll hear, I'll hear some grognar talking about how this is is way too MMO like because given the um, given the given the fact that we've stated one d four is 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 far too, is far too little. The question that I end up having and it and isn't answered is, can you stack this? Stacking wounds, you know. That could be really good, but at at uh, level one, you can only wounding strike twice before you have to rest to regain your points. Um, so you, if it could stack, you'd only be able to stack it twice, and that's assuming that you know whatever you're hitting isn't already dead after the second strike. Right. Considering how how uh, considering it's at level one, yeah, or. Um, it hasn't already shaken off the effect of the first one when you attack it again, or what there's... I, what yeah, I, I, can, I can answer this, actually, because technically speaking, this falls under condition and condition-adjacent rules. Mm -hmm. This would not stack. You, you would just go with the higher DC. Uh, the other thing I noticed is that this is not a wound system. This is basically just the condition ongoing damage. And yeah. that that is something that D and D has a history of, and you can you can tie it into, especially given that they were just coming off fourth edition. So it's not it's not so outside the it's not outside the bounds. It's just a really terrible iteration of it. I think temporary con damage would be more uh, more interesting, but of course, temporary con damage would also be potentially broken depending on how much temporary con damage you cause. So that still doesn't solve the problem. That's another one of those things where, unfortunately, 5th edition, with very few exceptions, toss that to the waste. I mean, Chomas Valley is filled to the... Filled to the... What's it? Ram, whatever you would say. Filled to... Whatever con container of your choice is filled with creatures that deal ability damage to it. And okay. in base d and I think there's only a few, like uh, the Shadow actually deals 1d4 strength damage to you. It's, it's surprisingly effective and makes the game a little bit more interesting, especially if you have to spend resources to deal with ability damage and you can't just reliably keep yourself. That's one way in which, okay, well, sure, you might be as effective on um, one hit point as 100 hit points, but I've taken you down from 18 intelligence to 13, and now you're not quite as effective across the course of the combat. But point being, we put this through the Matrix... And it's about two points. It I shouldn't maybe I shouldn't say points here. Uh, whatever our incremental unit of measurement is, this thing is at like a minus two. It's a weight. It's weighted to minus two. It's um, yes. It's weighted to minus two. Mm -hmm. And and like I said, even even without pushing it through the ma the matrix, um, intuitively you can just see that from from the very beginning. Exactly. Restrict Restricting and it. No particular the, the benefit of the matrix mm -hmm. is you mentioned this earlier, is you have an intuitive sense just looking mm -hmm. at it. This just kind of visually represents things. Yes. And if you look at the good. matrix on your own and stuff like that, and you look and you see something that sticks out at you, like, wait, this would be most frequently used in a specific edge case, or maybe not even an edge case, but a set of circumstances that the player would probably one probably know about and two would probably have the ability to engineer for themselves in which this would be more effective because the matrix takes care of all of the baseline things and puts them into more simple numerical values mm -hmm. it's actually easier to spot those edge cases and you have to wade through less fog in order to you have to stumble through less fog and darkness 
in order to discover those in which those would be valuable, which is why I think we, we all came to the same conclusion about both, both in a rigorous sense of we've gone through and we, we've judged this thing by all its component parts and found it wanting and intuited that it's that it kind of sucks. I mean, you could increase this thing to maybe D12 damage, yeah. the, and that might make it worth it. The big the big reason why I why I took issue with um with the way with the way it was presented is when you look at the general a general vibe that I get with a lot of the maneuvers is that speed is um key. A lot of these are a lot of these. You look. It's not in this. It's not going to be in the same level of complexity as, say, spells. A lot of these are going to be very quick and to the point because they're effectively tricks. Whereas some something like this, something the, whereas with this one, there needs to be the rule and then far too many exceptions to make this rule viable. Right. Even if you did fix, even if you did fix the damage, there are enough exceptions that. I mean, the only reason the exceptions don't come into play right now is because the creature would ignore the damage because mm -hmm. it's only a D four. So they, there's no particular reason for them to screw over their own action economy to pay attention to it, and they might just end it as a matter of circumstance. Whereas all of these other things are a very immediate effect. You see the fruits of your labor mm -hmm. instantaneously. And and yeah, no, that's that's an excellent point. And it's a shame because this is actually a kind of pull. If this w had a different, if this was not first draft, by which I don't necessarily mean that somebody wrote it for the very first time, but it was the first. Uh, the, this is the first output of a larger cognitive process, just adjusted for for spelling errors and stuff like that. Of a, of a theme in pulp where you know the the hero manages to get a nick on the person's arm and they you know now their arm is getting bloody and stuff like that eventually they nick them again and they see their opponent is really starting to slow and they steadily get the upper hand in the, in more matched battles this is more of an effect because they hit them and then their opponent slowly starts slowing down and then that degree the, their advantage accelerates over their opponent who has become so slowed by these various nicks and wounds that they've been accumulating across the course of the battle. Right? That is the thing that you see in Pulp. Hell, I, I just finished uh, Nine Princes in Amber, my third read of it, last night. And the, the duel between Corwin and Eric. This, oh, is, this, is, this is where that pops up. This is exactly uh. where that pops up. But it's such a terrible execution of that Pulp thing that nobody's going to use it. It will fall by the wayside. I... He just reminded me that I need to reread the, the Chronicles of Amber again. <laughs> There's never a bad time to reread the Chronicles of Amber. <clears throat> this would be like, what, my 15th or 16th read through in the last decade? I don't know. Never too many rereads. Yes, this is true. The last thing was a joke. You can never have too many rereads, and you can never have too much. You can never have too many dice. And there's exactly. never, yes. and the, there's the, never the enough of Daka. Man. No, there never is enough not. Daka. Um, so far, looking at all of the mechanically, looking at all of the uh, the schools or or uh, I, I don't know if you'd call them schools or just styles, traditions. I think they're called in this. Yeah. Um, I think mechanically and flavor wise, my favorite has to be Sanguine Knot because. A lot of 5e base play I've seen rewards working together. And Sanguine Knot is all about that. Mechanically, uh, it's all about, yeah, you, you and your allies are supporting each other to make this fight your advantage. And so I, I just love... Uh, <laughs> I, I love the uh, the double team bonus action. That's a fantastic, that's a fantastic maneuver. Mm -hmm. You know, again, change minor advantage to plus two on their attack roll, but that means you, you you hit somebody, and an ally within twenty feet of you gets to hit that person with a plus two. Go for it. 
Have I not <laughs> made it clear that my favorite fourth edition class was the Warlord? No, you've made that clear, and I'm not. I'm <laughs> not doing this clear. to gain favor with you. I I'm doing this based off of my experiences with Five E. Uh, you should know that I wouldn't do anything to gain favor with you, Monk. I don't need to. I'm bane your existence. <laughs> the one I found particularly interesting was Mist and Shade, because I am seeing an inordinate number of skill rolls incorporated within Mist and Shade. It's... Things like making a sleight of hand check as a reaction for the third degree. That I found particularly interesting because the question of, mostly because of a design question I've had more recently, which is, how do I assist players, how do I incentivize them to improvise actions? Especially given that I'm developing a card-based tabletop game. So that the, you might think that the trying to incentivize players in order to improvise in a card-based game might be somewhat difficult. But the, the conclusion I came to was I could give people cards which only keyed off of basically you have to take the improvised action if you want to make use of this card. So if you have it in your hand, you're more likely to improvise with it. And that's what draw, drew my eye to these particular this particular school or tradition of different fighting abilities was the fact that if you chose this thing, it's in your repertoire, and you're able to spend points on it, so you're more likely... Because one, one of the big problems in, with improvising in general is you don't... You and your GM alike don't necessarily know how to resolve the improv improvisation. You don't know which skill role to go with. You don't know which what the maximum effect should be. So getting from zero improv to one improv is this huge hurdle that is very difficult to tackle, and you might never tackle it. But if you iterate on it, if you go from one to two, it's actually quite easy. If you go to from one to five, it gets way easier as time goes on because you is you and your GM develop a unspoken or maybe even a spoken sort of agreement as to what the general effect, what the range of effects that you can produce with this improvised action are going to be. So if you give the person an ability which is, this only costs one point, and you can make a sleight of hand, you're, you're, you're a pickpocket, you can make a sleight of hand check as a reaction against somebody within, within range of you, you're going to be popping that off frequently. Meaning that your GM is going to be interacting with it frequently, and is likely, hopefully, going to develop a range of uh, a range of potential effects with you that that's going to do. We go back to, I'm going to unbuckle your sword belt, giggity. I uh, <laughs> I like I like uh, the 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 way painful pickpocket works. You stabbed me, but I stole something from you. Bye. Wait, which one is that? Is that a second degree? No, that's a first degree. Painful first pickpocket. Degree. Let me Pick go the... all the way back. Reaction. When a creature hits you with a melee attack, you can use your reaction to make a sleight of hand against it. I like that a lot. <laughs> you stabbed me, but I stole from you. Bye! Hey, 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 GM, what did I steal? Uh, rolls dice. You you stole a diamond worth 50 GP. Hell yeah, worth the four points of damage. You stole his sword. <laughs> and you you brings, stole his sword. <laughs> that, brings a, that brings an interesting point with, with this sort of thing. And um, something that I'm pr I'm pretty sure is gonna I'm pretty sure once again is gonna piss off the traditionalists, but once again, fuck them. Did you see that tweet I wrote earlier today, Mildra? No. Okay. Do you know what the tweet was? No. The tweet, and I'll give it to you verbatim, is if you start anything with "I'm gonna say something a little controversial," it had better be the funniest shit I've ever heard in my life. Um. It's. I don't think the traditionalists are going to get that pissed off at you. Um, <laughs> assuming they're you even would, watching. You say that. You say that. Okay. And as far as the whole what, as far as the whole watching thing, but after the, after that, um, that in real life rant that got thrown at me over what I said on Star Frontiers, I don't know. <laughs> but worse but with with abilities like that you're seeing that you're seeing um a bit of a breaking away from the from the standard fighter thing that we've bitched about over the years some of us some of us for longer than others because 
I could e I could easily see the argument being made that maneuvers like that should be relegated solely to the rogue and not the fighter. Ignoring the ignoring the fact that um while some people might while some people might dispute it having a, as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned characters like Errol Flynn or Z or Zora or the like should should still qualify as fighters. Not every fighter should have the expectation of being um, sword and board and covered in and covered in plate. Well, that's well, the I, thing because they're not because the fighter is not meant to emulate any kind of medieval archetype. We're meant to emulate the pulps. Mm -hmm. Fight fighter is meant to be fighter, N not any yeah. specific, not any so, specific type of fighter. Just fighter is meant to be fighter. Mm -hmm. So Corwin of Amber is a bit is a bit way more of a slippery bastard, but he's Corwin. still. He's not really a. You wouldn't call him a rogue, or a I thief. Wouldn't, I He's wouldn't just a really him, slippery bastard. I wouldn't call Corwin a fighter either. I'd call him a really? fucking sorcerer. <laughs> Every one of the princes of Amber or any of the uh, of any of the lords of chaos are fucking sorcerers. But this uh, is no, rails. they're scions. But that's a different thing. <laughs> but this is rails. This is rails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. no the, the point being that we're when we're evaluating his fighting ability, he's, he's a slippery bastard, but he's still relatively straightforward insofar as how he fights. He's yes. still going, he's approaching people in the duel and stuff like Very that. And so adding a little bit, we'll be able to evaluate that once we actually come to the rogue and see what they have access to. Cause yes. certainly the fighter should not have more abilities than the rogue does. And so in line with, uh, mist and whatever that I've, that I've, Forgot it. Missed him, whatever. Shade. Missed him shade. Because I've just gotten so focused in on all of those different sleight of hand checks. God, that would be fantastic. Like, oh, he, he hits me with the attack. I'd like to make a sleight of hand to steal something from him. What? His sword. He that was him it. cutting into it me. Did. Was He was cutting into my armpit a little bit after I, after I got his sword from him. He, 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 he stabbed me. I want to keep it in my body. I'm yes, clenching I'd like my it, Yeah, right muscles. there. Um, but yeah, that's that's the idea. Is now if the because that's only one element of the fighter, so they're allowed to dip into it a little bit more. The yeah. other thing I'd like to note is this: it would this would be amazing multi-class fighter, one of the uh, fodder, one of the most fun characters I had access to was a Battlemaster Six uh, Conjuration Conjuration Wizard Six. And that was actually a way more fun Eldritch Knight than anything I was interacting with for the, um, yeah, it was, I mean, it was just a more fun Eldritch Knight. I had all these abilities I had access to, and funnily enough, especially with some of the more recent melee cantrips that came out, I got to have a lot of fun just popping off a maneuver on top of this melee-based cantrip that I was using. Or I would be able to use fancy footwork, and on top of that, I would be able to cast shield because they weren't interfe interfering with the action resolution of one another. This would be so. If you had this in the game, it would lower the threshold for a lot of different classes to be effective because you would be able to combine them with. So obviously, you would want a class to stand on its own. But if you were at a table that allowed multiclassing, and I don't know why you wouldn't be at a table that allowed multiclassing. Uh, these these could help shore up a lot of underperforming content. Assuming your GM just didn't like, you know, in order to smooth over, patch over the design, didn't just port one feature from one class to another in order to, in order to help things out. Mm -hmm. And which is not to say that I approve. Last disclaimer, I promise. Which is not to say I approve of GMs playing designer, but. With WotC, it's something of an inevitability, and it's the it's the trend of the age. So preparing for that instance, rather than just trying to stopgap them from it, tends to be the better approach in my mind. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and then as as Monk and I always say, uh, name the last time or the the joke that continues to go. Name the last time that we played with the the rules as is. Can't do that. It's not possible to name that last time. <sighs> now. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the idea, the idea of um, 
of ec of exploration next. I'm curious. Now we can we kind of dipped into it in the fact that it's giving is giving some is giving some more narrative uti um, narrative and mechanical utility with with the with um these um what's what's been your what's been your guys' take on on exploration next and rep and um reput reputation and martial lore because all three of those are kind of going on this are kind of going on the same theme of giving of giving some sort of utility that's not necessarily um, direct combat. So reputation is something you only get at tenth level mm -hmm. because you're you've established a reputation that is now beginning to precede you, as it says. Um, and you choose one of those uh, those reputation knacks, I guess. Yeah. Um, honestly, it really like th this can give to the flavor to your fighter. Um, some people are going to just take what they feel fits the fighter's backstory, how the fighter is as a person. Others are going to take whatever they feel will be mecha most mechanically advantage uh, advantageous for them. Uh, either way, I think there's not really much you can go wrong with the reputation thing, but uh, it's not as mechanically... It's not as mechanically involved as, say, the Exploration Knacks. Um, I I really actually like some of these uh, exploration knacks, especially extreme leap, um, implying that you've been doing a lot of uh, a lot of training with your your uh, lower half to never skip leg day, <laughs> and uh, that you can even go the full distance of your jump, despite the fact that it might exceed your speed because you can triple your jump distance for the turn. It's funny, funny you meant. As soon as you said that, I immediately thought of um, jump good, in particular <laughs> because yeah, when when I was running Numenera, the one of the the uh, character that Shades was playing was a barbarian who knew how to jump good, to the point where he could reasonably pass level even before he got to the highest tier, he could reasonably pass level ten tests to jumping. Because when I say he could jump good, I mean he was jumping the same way a dragoon might jump. <laughs> oh, nice! But uh... these just scream pulp to me. Yeah, it, and it's nothing that it psychs me. I, in fact, to the extent that I almost don't think that they belong in this system, <laughs> but I can see the designers at their keyboard saying, "I don't know if somebody's going to use the systems that these are attached to, but God, these are so much. These are just fun." I can see Mike Merle's at his desk, just like typing away. It's like <sighs> I'm going to put it in anyway. I don't know if anybody's going to use the encumbrance thing, but man, the flavor text is so cool, and we're putting... These are all ribbon abilities anyway, so I'm just going to... I am free to make these as cool as I want. Yeah. And, and to the and, extent where if you do use the systems that these are attached to, mm -hmm. to some degree, this helps establish your role in the party outside of combat. Yeah, and, and that's the reason that I think that they're... Okay. It, it, as as you pointed out, they're not necessarily something that's going to impact anything. They're 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 not going to necessarily uh, define the, the character if they're gone. What's going to continue to define the character's role primarily are going to be the maneuvers. But add these in, you get more flavor, and it helps to flesh out your character to right to expand. like the Night Watch. Yeah. yeah. Something something that I find interesting with um with the with the way with the way that um our, with the way that class design ends up working for um for fifth edition and to a and to a certain and to a different degree um thirteenth age as well has has this particular motif is treating class advancement as its own kind of story arc. see that and i look at this and it and i i can see them very much leaning into this there is a small part of me that what that wonders it what sort of game breaker there's going to be in the uh, teens because when you look at when you look at a lot of class designs usually around 14th level there's some sort of game breaker not nece not necessarily in the literal sense of breaking the game but something that really messes with a core 
mechanic to that class's benefit. That will be interesting to see to see if they actually put something in that that's uh, that's that. I think the best way to say it is it's a paradigm shift. You're changing the paradigm of the class to, to one that's even more advantageous. <clears throat> and I wonder if they'll right. put that, that level of Which paradigm just, shift. It just happens to be that the, the game cannot support that paradigm shift. Yeah, and I'm wondering if, if what, th what the uh, Level Up 5e project will put into their classes for later levels will have a paradigm shift of that great of an effect. They may have decided to balance it out a little bit better. They may have decided that that while there will be a paradigm shift, it will still fit within the confines of the game. Right. Uh, well, that's the thing. Are they using this specific material for their uh, whatever their project is? Yeah they've they've been doing they've been doing um serve they've been doing surveys, often often on for the last year for the last um year or so, when it com when it comes to it, I'd say I'd um I'd say. Well, is Wait, wait, real quick. Is this the original Five E playtest, or is this the? No, this is this is the Level Up playtest. I I was referring Yo. when I when I was referring to the original Five E playtest. That was mainly to bring up how um, the the difference between how maneuver dice were used in that playtest and superiority dice for the um, Battle Master. Oh goddamn! I wish I wish I knew that the previous because uh, I thought this was just the original survey material. No, the yeah. level up comes from a, from Ian Publishing and isn't actually from Watsy. Mm -hmm. um, this right, is right. I remember seeing something up along the lines of level up. That's that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. the the level up playtest is is them attempting to make five e. I guess better is the best way to put it. Then. Um. That's the, well, the playable full, after two campaigns. The full the full title of the level up playtest, which they've admitted is um level up is not going is probably not going to be the final um title when Name. they when they when they crowdfund this is level up advanced fifth edition. My my joke to to monk at that point was like advanced advanced Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition. Don't they realize that fifth edition is already an AD and D? <laughs> I I get mad at that, but I can't. I real I really can I really cannot be mad. It's it, it's a it's a good joke. <laughs> I think it's I think it's chaotic good, in fact. Which is why I can't be mad. I'd certainly like to be, but I can't. <laughs> but uh yeah this this material is is all their attempt at making lacking aspects of 5e better mm -hmm. yeah this is our own iteration of d20 this is as if they took the uh that's so funny i wonder if mike balls is working on this <laughs> of course it wouldn't be yeah. um but no it's it's because i because a lot of these are most ask but point being uh, they're basically taking 5th edition in the direction in which it would have gone, provided that the let's keep our 4E players, half of the design team of the original 5th edition, had won, rather than the let's return to the let's pick up laps 3.5 players, let's, uh, let's develop the 3.5 retirement home. Yeah. Um, I will I will admit that when I used the term game breaker that was me that was me um somewhat referencing the the how the um homebrew community when it comes to fantasy craft cuz they put a um they did make their own matrix when it come when it came to people creating um classes and they list um level 14 as where as where the game breaker is put in and to give an example the soldier in fantasy craft which is basically the equivalent of the fighter um, at 14th level has a feature called one in a million where you can make where, and you can only do this once per session, which might seem a bit restrictive, but when you consider what this is, I think you'll understand why 
you can t you can treat one attack check, one fort save, or one strength or constitution based skill check as automatically a natural twenty. This oh, is geez. this is considered a critical. You cannot be forced to re-roll that nat, that nat 20. You can only do this once per session. Yeah, those are the ones I have definitely have less of an interest in. But in any case... Mm -hmm. um, now, when, now, one thing, one thing that, I do, that I do hope is, is tackled... Because even though even though fifth edition is ve is very hands off when it comes to the concept of feats, I would like to hope that there is that there is at least something that there is that when it comes to at the very least this representation of how they're how they're going to be handling classes, that there are going to be some feats that take advantage of it, whether it be just extra maneuvers or or something like that, or or even um. Even something for the people who really who really want to delve into getting more stuff out of it, out of their exertion pool. Um, but the big issue that I that I can see having, and I kind of I kind of dipped into this early on, is the relationship with arc with fighter archetypes. Now I've been recently reading through um, Spheres of Power and Might, which, if I get the chance, I might want to send your way, um, Ash. And that kind of ta that kind of talks about back at back adapting some of its systems within more traditional um, classes. And what I'm curious of, and the thing that the thing that I'm both curious and frightful for is is how is how well do you see s certain subclasses adapting to this new um approach to the fighter existing so going across the existing spread of subclasses yeah for so for the sake of for the sake of sanity let's let's just go with the base 3 subclasses and if there's any if there's any oh, that stick out no. at you how <laughs> Okay, never mind then. <laughs> Let's go with all. Let's go with all of them. So, if we're taking, let we'll start off with the base three classes because yeah. we might as well go in chronological okay. order. Okay. So for that's fine. For this, that's fine. But I, well, that wasn't going to stop me from teasing for... you about. It. <laughs> Fuck you, man. For this, so I, here's the format that I want you to go with. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the, I'm gonna give you the name. And then I want you to give me thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle, and why. Sound good? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's that's perfect. All right. Champion. Uh, thumbs in the middle. It depends. I do not see maneuvers here which function off things like critical hits. I can see maneuvers here which will be more effective based on critical hits, but nothing that is... I have... I, of course, it's going to be in there somewhere. But I don't see a lot that would be especially made more effective via critical hits. It would just be the the. Here's my problem: the critical hits. I want the critical hit to be more of a force force multiplier for these different effects, and I feel like it would the the crit would be more of a the additional damage that you would be getting from the crit because that's all you would get from the crit is more of like a static bonus. So thumbs in the middle. It wouldn't be negatively impacted by the maneuvers, which is my only, my only main concern. But it wouldn't be. It's not. It's not quite as much as I would like. All right, Battlemaster. Battlemaster only positively. The, thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Hands down. <laughs> yeah. Because the, as as mentioned, you can r retain the. It's very easy. If everybody has extra maneuvers, some people might say, oh, well, then what are we going to do with the Battle Master? And my, I always had two answers to that, which was, one, I will take that trade. I will take getting rid of the Battle Master for everybody having the Battle Master. That's not a difficult trade for me. But second, if everybody has the maneuvers, having one person be especially good with the maneuvers is a fine mechanical hook. So thumbs up with a little bit of trepidation because only focusing on the maneuvers 
might actually, it's entirely possible that somebody could screw up and make it so that the, the maneuvers were actually focusing too much on making the maneuvers better would actually kind of screw up the Battlemaster insofar as uh, it, the Battlemaster might be looking to their friends and saying, ah, this, this kind of doesn't feel as good as the other thing they would do. I want to have something in addition, in addition to the maneuvers I'm already getting. So maybe a thumbs up. Yeah, I'm still going to maintain it as a thumbs up because I think these designers are relatively competent. I will put one caveat because I don't know if the, I don't know if this is even going to be tackled, and that is put in and that is put in some kind of feat, so a exertion point could be tra could be traded for a superiority die and vice versa. You probably get well. Chances are their iteration of the Battlemaster is going to be the superiority is, is going to be the exertion. They're going to replace the superiority die with the exertion die. Almost almost certainly. Alright. Eldric Knight. Eldritch Knight? I'm going to give a very tentative thumbs up. A very tentative thumbs up. I don't... People screw up on Gishes all the time. I think the primary thing about Gishes is that they're supposed to be you want them to be good at something which is not simply fighting and not simply spellcasting and not simply admit the fact that you can do both of them. Uh, you want some sort of interplay between what it is that you're doing with your spells, with your magic, more generally speaking, and what you're doing with your martial ability. Now, these guys could go into that and say, okay, we're going to include magical maneuvers. Um... And I've just now realized <laughs> this will be slightly off topic. I'm going to keep it to about 30 seconds. I've now realized that I looked at what these guys did with stances and I had mentioned, oh my God, that's basically what I did with stances. And then I hear, and now that I know that this is not in fact the 5e play test, this is the level up play test. So now I'm looking at it like, oh, oh, I see. You guys got to where I, oh, okay, fine. Which actually makes them be more happy with these people because Maybe they'll get some magical maneuvers, which I've already invented. And they'll just converge, much as like uh, everything evolves into crabs eventually. Everything's going to evolve, all RPG design is going to evolve into things I've discovered already. <laughs> which I'm fine with. Okay. Purple Dragon Knight. Purple Dragon Knight. I know slightly less about the what I know about them is primarily thanks to the Dungeon Cast and thank you Dungeon Cast indeed for for this because they had a pretty good explanation of it. This is where you might be able to yell at the designers for not having a um and, I, and I've gone past our format so I will now give it I'm going to give it a thumbs down actually. Okay. I don't think that the purple cuz the purple dragon knight it, it was one it's it's a Faroon. Fair rule? Fair no, that's there, that's it uh, does have a setting thing. neutral name as Banneret. Right. Wh whatever the hell whatever it ends up being, I'm gonna give it a thumbs down because I felt like that was the one that had the most difficulty adapting Wardlord features, which were intended to act as Warlord features. I don't think that that one's going to do quite as well. Cause that had a that had the structure of the abilities tended to be we're going to use the things that we give you to you and your class, like, for instance, Second Win, and we're going to translate that outwards to other people. I don't think that, that they could do that effectively with the maneuvers as presented without either a lot of work or making them underpowered or the worst of both worlds, both. So I'm going to give that one a thumbs down. I don't think that one's going to be as, as healthy. All right. Arcane Archer. Also no. Oh, thumbs also up. <laughs> Also known as um, Green Arrow. <laughs> no, not Green. No, no we're not doing. No. Get that cape shit out of here. This is the this is the arcane archer. This is the magic archer from fucking Dragon's Dogma. And yeah, I think, I, yeah, I'll I, go with that. I'm gonna give so, this one a so thumbs long up. As it's not the Dragon's Dogma anime because that anime was shit. I saw, I think, two minutes of that anime, and I'm glad that I stopped watching. Good. The because uh, I really like Dragon's Dogma, especially since I started playing it when it was bundled with the, whatever the DLC was. So Dark everything Risen. was a lot more. Everything was a lot cooler. You've probably enjoyed the meme of 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 somebody deciding to do 
some crazy guy decided to do a build entirely built around cheesing Arc of Obliteration to one punch every single boss. Well, almost yeah, that every tracks. single boss. That tracks. And that's the sort of thing that you could do in Dragon's Dogma. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at the Arcane Archer, I'm giving this one a thumbs up more vociferously than I gave the Eldritch Knight a thumbs up because what the Arcane Archer has access to now is already sort of magical maneuvers. Mm -hmm. They're not as cool as the things that I've developed or as the things that my source material developed. For instance, Dragon's, Dog Dragon's Dogma, uh, the funnel uh, maneuver in particular was so much choice. For those of you who aren't aware, you would fire basically a tornado in a line and smaller enemies would get dragged into that tornado and then you would just you would just unload on them. Uh, so I think that the, they already have a basic template for what magical maneuvers specifically tied to ranged attacks would look like. So they would just have to translate those over and make them better. And as we've already established, they're pretty good at that. So thumbs up. Okay. Um, Cavalier, which Cavalier, I'm going to give that one. I'm going to give that one a thumbs up. Uh, the fifth edition Cavalier introduced another mark, and that was pretty effective. And, and, and the biggest concern with the Cavalier was making it so that it was not dependent on being mounted, because being mounted in fifth edition sucks, and you don't want to have to do it. But they made it so that, like, oh, in a rare moment of insight, they made it so that the Cavalier would be good normally, but even better if he was mounted, especially with some of his, some of his other abilities. And besides that, just had a, a, a heavy defensive role that was effective and impressive and something that would be attractive to you even if you didn't want to be mounted. Mm -hmm. So translating that over to... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to maintain my thumb. Mm, no, I'm going to go thumb. I'm going to go middling. Thumbs in the middle. Because they might actually have a lot of difficulty maintaining that balance for maneuvers. And it might come down to the same thing where either it seems like a lot of work or they just have to make them less powerful than the other maneuvers and some of them slip through the cracks and they're not as, they're not as fun to play around with. Or again, the worst of both worlds. Mm -hmm. This is something that they could screw up. All right. And it wouldn't necessarily be their fault because of the class because of the structure that they're working with, but they might they might do it right. All right. Samurai. Samurai, I'm going to give them a thumbs up. Uh Samurai is pretty simplistic and they already introduced maneuvers that in that introduce healing and the samurai has sort of uh fight, a fighting spirit that's that's in line with the healing and stuff like that. So I think when they heal from maneuvers, it's, they're probably going to give them a bonus. Uh, I think when they do certain precision attacks, I think when they do certain attacks that deal additional damage based on conditions and mechanical hooks, as we were describing earlier, like fitting them into the matrix of, of cost and benefit comparisons, I think that they I think they have all the mechanical hooks built in and they would probably just make those mechanical hooks better. So I feel I and so thumbs up. I think it's going to be straightforward to do the samurai because I'm already predicting which ones they're going to make use of. All right. Monster Hunter. Did the Monster Hunter make it in? I've got I've got it on I've got it on my list. Um, I thought the Monster Hunter was a uh, was a ranger. No, I, I think don't. it's I think it's a ranger right now. There there is an unearthed arcana. I would make a joke that uh, the the answer for Monster Hunter is yes, but that's because every weapon they have is gigantic. Right? Did they did they include that in this one? Um. Or is that like an official 5e subclass? Because I don't think it's an official... I think it's, it's an official 5e ranger subclass. Um, I have it... Actually, um, Monster Hunter was in, was put in as a fight... Was put in as a fighter archetype in Unearthed Arcana 14 Gothic Heroes. Right. And that's the thing is it didn't make it into the official. I'm st I'd still be... I'd still be curious... How well, how well you think 
the monster hunter archetype would interplay with the level up fighter i would say i'm gonna give it a thumbs up for the same reason that i gave a thumbs up with the samurai mm. is that it's it's straightforward it already makes use of a lot of the different effects here uh, i think that monster hunter might actually see more play with the exploration acts and uh, give give you additional options for those uh, I think it's going to be a perfectly middling, not too powerful, not underpowered, a little bit more flavor than mechanical. And and players might have to work a little bit more with the mechanics if they want to be as strong as the other guys, but it's not going to be so bad that they're not able to do that. All right. So I'll give it a thumbs up for simplicity. All right. Um, Echo Knight. <laughs> I'm gonna give this one a big thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can completely, I, I can completely understand why, especially since, for, I can, I have, I um, I love Echo Knights spe specifically because of the fact that I get to be a complete and total asshole when it comes to the magic of blocking. Well, I say I, I'm playing with a uh, my buddy Geo is currently playing an Echo Knight, and and our characters are usually pretty intertwined, and and they are in this campaign as well. So we're doing a lot of combat together, and he's having a lot of fun with it. Um, he he tends to prefer more simplistic characters in the in the nominal sense, but the Echo Knight is so much fun. Matt Mercer outdid himself as far as I'm concerned with the Echo Knight. He did such a good job on that class. So big thumbs up. I think that they're not going to have a lot of trouble. In court, uh, some of the maneuvers are already things that that would be effective mm -hmm. because of the additional movement options, and it would not be that big of a leap in order to make sure that they work with the Echo Knight. So I think I don't think they're going; they're not going to have the trouble that magical maneuvers might have, insofar as examples are concerned, and they're not going to have the trouble of making some of these effects. The additional system or additional play space that the Echo Knight is interacting with is not too different to be ineffective for the maneuvers that already exist. So the maneuvers that are going to get added, which are probably tailored to the Echo Knight, and the abilities that are tailored to the Echo Knight, are not going to be too far off. Yep. And even if they are, they'll be able to make use of the existing maneuvers to, to pretty good effect. So I'm going to give that one a thumbs up. Yep. Um, brute. Brute, that was a I, thumbs down, thumbs down. That was a bad UA. That was that was just bad. It wasn't working. If they wanted to make the brute effective, they should have put it in rogue to go with like a. I almost say Carsa Orlong. Uh, I'm thinking of Kalam Makar. If they went with that guy from the Malazan series as their source material, that would have been more effective as a rogue subclass. Just making making a strength based rogue with which they eventually did. I think in the. Mike Merles did with the Marauder on a Thracana, and that was a that was a focus of the Mike Merles happy fun hour. So I think they could, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to give it a thumbs down. It was badly executed, probably not worth attacking, probably better attached to a different class. I don't think they're going to touch it. Um, I've looked at I've looked at the brute, and to be to be quite honest, whenever I whenever I see it, I I just think of. Why go? Why go with this when you can just go with the crit fisher in as um as cha as champion? Yeah, it's it's stepping on too many toes and not providing enough mechanical benefit to to just go with the people that you're stepping on the toes of. It is funny that when I put when I put in when I put in brute as a uh, go as a Google search, just put in brute five e. The one of the first results I get is a thread about whether or not the brute is op. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, well, nobody, it's 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 not OP, because I don't see why anybody would want to play it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Survivor is, cu is cute at 18, but at 18th level, the amount of hit points that you're gaining passively from that is not really worth it when you're going to... Nobody's play. playing at 18th, le 18th level, because 5e... If you, even if you were playing at 18th level... um. The amount of you're going to be swimming in so many hit points at that point that the amount that you'd get from that is not really worth it. Anyway. But well, what I'm saying is, because nobody is playing at 15, 18th level, none of the abilities, none of the features are evaluated. Yeah. Uh, for their actual mechanical effectiveness, that at best you're looking at like 
putting in late level features to make a given subclass more enticing, but with the knowledge that they're never actually going to play it and just trying to get some extra mileage out of your content. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rune Knight. There's a few more official ones that I think I don't think you attacked. Sorry, what did you say? Rune Knight. Rune Knight. Okay, back to the official ones. Rune Knight is going to be difficult for the same reason as the Cavalier. I'm going to give this one a thumbs down because there's a lot of long rest features that need to be interacted with for the Rune Knight. There are a lot of... Uh, it's just so different. And it's very much like a, a Nova focus subclass. Uh, not completely Nova focus. You you get some other abilities. You get to make use of them, especially as you get, especially as you get your second loadout of uh, subclass features. Mm -hmm. It tends to it takes it takes on more of an identity of its own. It's not just the Nova there, but it, it's so. I don't see what they've developed here interacting positively with the Rune Knight as it currently exists. It would basically be a full rework. Uh, so I'm going to give it a thumbs down. I don't think I think they might they might do it, but I think they would struggle with that one more than they would the others. Mm -hmm. Um, scout, scout. Um, I think that made it into a rogue subclass. So I'm going to give it a thumbs down because I think that's just going to be iterated as a rogue. Hang on, let me ch let me check. It's a it's a rogue in Tasha, so I'm like ninety percent sure. Or Xanathar's one of the two. Yeah, it, it looks yeah, it looks like um looks like Xanathar bumped it into bumped it into rogue. It was originally a um fight it was originally a fighter archetype for UA. I honestly mm -hmm. I honestly think putting it putting it in um in putting it in rogue Feels feels like a case uh, feels like a um, missed opportunity, I guess. But the big problem with something like this is that this a a subtype like Scout is completely undermined by the mere presence of multiclassing. It depends on the mechanics, because if the mechanics are good, then you would want to multi. That's just additional multiclassing fodder. The, of course, the other the other problem is, it's using superiority die, but the bit but um unlike say the monster hunter, um, the u the use of it isn't a, isn't um as good or as unique enough. Yeah, I'm only familiar with it in its rogue mm -hmm. iteration, which is as far as I'm concerned, that's where it should be because the rogue is the martial character with a you spread get, of thief like skills. You get f so. You, you, when you start out with, now of course I'm ref, I'm referencing the um, the UA version with this. You start right, out and I'm not I'm not familiar with the UA. But we should probably skip that one. I you could tell the audience uh, what it what's about. Yeah, but I I probably shouldn't comment on its design. Um, you get three you get three more you get three more proficiencies uh when it comes to skills, um. Or you can drop you can drop one of the skill proficiencies to learn, to get proficiency with thieves tools if you want. You get four d8 um, superiority die, which you ha which you can use for for a skill boost, a at a attack boost, or an a or an AC boost, and taking half damage from from a hit. So basically. It's basically skill, attack, and evasion. Yeah, porting rogue features over instead of inventing new rogue features, which is what they did with the rogue scout, mm -hmm. was they just invented new features, like reactions for running away. Um, which was actually quite good. Mm -hmm. And was actually multi-class fighter yeah. fodder. I had a few people multi-class that with fighter and other classes. Now the, the, oh, the scout archetype for rogue. The last one that I've got on my list... Um, Shout which, out to Nitro, which was um, which was a bit amusing because this did result in what this did result in so in um one particular one particular class debate that start that prompted a that prompted a Kickstarter from you, mm -hmm. the Cyanite. <laughs> Cyanite. Uh, I think that this one is actually going to be 
more effect- I think that the the official Sinite struggles most with the fact that it is very dependent on getting up in levels. <laughs> the lower level abilities are not that interesting, so it makes for poor multi-class fodder, which is weird for a fighter. Generally, that's not the case. Uh, and it's it, the more interesting abilities, like a temporary flying ability, some of the more advanced telekinetic powers that you get access to, those come in around 7th level, which is your second sub uh, spread of subclass features mm-hmm. for the Sinite. I think so. I'm going to give it a thumbs up because I think that they've made it pretty clear that they could evaluate the matrix. I think that those psionic uh, maneuvers are going to be right at home in their system. And I think that the sort of matrix, even if they don't have their own matrix that they've developed, which I don't see often in design, so I, they, there's a good chance that they don't. But as we went through ourselves, you can sort of intuit a lot of these things. You can construct it on the fly if you feel that you need to. And they probably would feel... I think that you always need to. Um, but they would likely feel that they need to at the very least for the Psychic Warrior. So we, so they would build it for the Psychic Warrior. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think that they... I, I think they would do fine with it. I think that it would be right at home in their current maneuver system. And they would adjust point costs because the the Sinite, one of the biggest problems with the Sinite is uh, the the first three abilities that you get are wildly different in terms of their utility and across way bigger spreads of situations. I would much rather have uh, the enhanced telekinesis than whatever the other one is, and I would much rather and so they would be able to expand it without increasing the overhead too much which is what 5e had to avoid and thus depower it, and they would be able to make sure that higher-level abilities, which needed to be gate-kept for a higher level to justify their low point cost, could be kept at a low point cost, so that once you got to a higher level, you could finally access this thing, and you could spam it. Mm-hmm. So, um, thumbs up for the Psychic Warrior. There... I feel like there's a f- I feel like there's a few that I, that I'm missing from this list, but it- uh, Mercer's Gunslinger maybe. Um, there's been plenty of U8 over time. Yeah. Um. Well, since you brought up since you brought up the uh, gun since you brought up the Gunslinger, what would you would you say that's thumbs up, down, or in the middle? I'm gonna give that one in the middle. I see I see a lot of dumb takes related to the Gunslinger. I see a lot of surprisingly dumb takes. I, I saw an article by... I won't mention their name. They, I saw an article by somebody who was criticizing the gunslinger and complaining that the weapon's misfire was higher than a natural one and that you would only ever include a misfire property for the sake of, a, uh, for the sake of adversarial DMing rather than as a balance mechanic for a given um for for a given higher tier sort of of loot and mechanical options basically because if you're going to be spamming if you're going to be spamming your flintlock or whatever you're going to be spamming bad you well you can't spam bad news that's that's the point of it and if you have if you attack four times on your turn with which I assume you're going to be doing with an action surge and you have a 20% chance of critically failing with this given weapon then one, you're going to be a little bit more careful with that weapon, but two, you're going to have a spread of different weapons. You're not going to be repairing your your weapon mid combat by and large, except with the one check. I think they give you like one check where it's like you can make this check in the middle of combat, and if you fail it, then you need to take it to then you need to take your tools to it, so it's out for the rest of the combat. But the assumption is you have like six guns on you. And then, of course, you're able to use all of the other fighter weapons, some of which are going to be able to interact with basic five, you know, the, the things that you would be using for the gunslinger. But most notably, especially for the level up play test, you would be using them in conjunction with those maneuvers. Mm-hmm. So it could go either way, but I see a lot of dumb takes around the, around the thing. It's just the gunslinger's primary balancing feature is an enhanced risk reward mechanic. And 5e does not do that particularly well, so Matt Mercer had to improvise. It's not adversarial DMing or anything like that. It's a balance mechanic. 
But I whether or not people get that, who knows? And whether or not people manage to get past that, and then it's not like they have an easy job ahead of them once they realize, hey, it's not adversarial DMing. It's an enhanced risk reward mechanic. Could be so frustrating. Could be so many chances that, oh, well, we're going to put minor advantage instead of major, minor disadvantage instead of major disadvantage or regular disadvantage. But there's so many of those that that just makes the gunslinger play as frustrating to play. So I don't think I, I'm going to give it a, a middle in the middle. Um, since, also, since you mentioned more, since you mentioned some of the stuff Merles has done, um, are you familiar at all with the Slayer? Vaguely, that was another like barbarian crossover, and I ignored it as as dead on arrival. And thumbs I... down, no comment. <laughs> That's my <laughs> that's my Slayer evaluation. Um, I, I, I ended up see, I ended up seeing that some somebody had somebody had put it on the D and D wiki, and um, although appar- apparently the editors for the wiki think it needs more fluff, honestly, if somebody asked me to do a Slayer subtype. As much as I'd get in trouble for this, I'd probably uti- I'd probably utilize the um, the appro- the approach of the Slayer that's in um, Warhammer Fantasy, where they're a fighter with a with a literal death wish. Yeah, that's see, that's where it's like, yeah, uh, just make a barbarian. Um, and normally I don't like people saying, well, just you make this other class, but that's one of those things. If you're literally including the other class features, you just make a barbarian. Yeah. Um, and when, and to be, to be honest, that's one of the, that's one of the rare cases where I'd put, where I'd put up with it. Um, I know, I know morals also brought up the weapon master, but to be honest, um, with that one, I'd probably put, I'd probably put it as a thumbs down simply because, um, First off, the idea of sub subclasses leaves a bad taste in my mouth, and second off, um, I love sub subclasses. I I mean, my first my first character was a hunter ranger, among other things, uh, and the hunter was just you know having additional options. You know, I'm the colossus slayer, I'm the horde breaker, and stuff like that. That was fun, but I wouldn't like it. I would give it a, a thumbs up only insofar as the wheel of whatever set of maneuvers, whichever one, the weapon master maneuvers, yeah. took care of the weapon master. So now you could be a weapon master on top of something be uh, on top of something interesting. So your entire identity is not just being a weapon master. So that and um, the early stuff for weapon master, if I'm reading the right one, isn't all that interesting and some of it's already covered by the ex by the um narr- by the more utility um fe- features that the level up fighter is going to get um like the whole the whole like gaining proficiency with smith's tools at third at third level um Zard, i believe if i'm if i'm not mistaken with at least one of the, with at least one of the max weapon lore yeah weapon lore i believe yeah, weapon lore already already covers that, and granted, that's at fifth level instead of third. But with but with weapon lore, I'd say I'd say that's um a little bit more useful than just gaining proficiency in, an, in another uh, set of tools. Which... Well, that's the thing. A lot of these a lot of these miss subclasses and Xanax. You, you've probably seen this before. Uh, is a lot of the, the the UA material that just misses. And sometimes even the official classes that just miss are we had this one cool idea for a mechanic and we had this one actual iteration of that mechanic and then we tried to build a subclass around it. Around it, mm-hmm. Not in so far as based on the mechanic but we just put this mechanic in there and then we put other mechanics in there that we thought were kind of thematically similar but we didn't pay as much attention to them. I- it's like well what do you know? People didn't give the 80% approval rating for the subclass that only had one interesting feature in it. I will which say that weapon, ma- weapon Mastery at 10th level might have been more interesting if um, 
if it weren't for the fact that, as I've mentioned in the past, a f there's not enough reason to utilize multiple multiple weapons between b between both the fighting between both the fighting style feature that you're going to be starting out with and so and the and the way um, combat ends up working. Yeah, I you're mean that's how they structured it. Is you pick what you want to be good at at the very beginning, and then you get to be good at that for the entirety of your uh, fighter's lifestyle. And you're really, it, it's basically only going to be range increments that are going to change what weapon you have currently equipped. Yeah, and if it if it were if it were a case where you had where where you're dealing with a fighter who was decked out in a bunch of different weapons, like they're front and commando or something. Maybe I maybe I'd be willing to go with that, but that's but obviously that's not the way the fighter is um uh, is approaching. So yeah, I mean to some degree the Kensei actually filled that uh filled that slot. Yeah, yeah, the Kensei could could specialize in what three different weapons? I think three, yeah, mm -hmm. and one of them was ranged. Yeah, um, and of course with and of course some of the other stuff is is a case of um of cr of crit fishing like. Um, getting getting to do crit getting to do crits on on an eight on an eighteen. And yeah, and like crit, crits in fifth edition are just the most uninteresting thing I could think of, especially since the the critical hit. You guys probably know these the like vicious weapon. It's like deal like seven extra damage on a critical hit. But I think it specifies that it has to be a natural twenty, and same for the vorpal weapon. So if you're like if you're like a champion or a kensei or, or any kind of any future subclass that comes out as a crit fisher, and you get that weapon, it's like, well, yeah, you got a critical hit, but like it needed to be a natural twenty if you wanted to use this special thing. It's like, man, that's what that's one of those things where you need to have a little bit more insight. Sorry, not insight. You need to have a little bit more foresight when it comes to. Hey, how are third party going to interact with this? How is homebrew going to interact with this? And how are our own future supplements going to interact with this? You know? Which given given all that, as a kind of capstone to that little experiment, what would you say what would you say are some of the things that that are the big determining factors about whether or not a subclass would be a thumbs up or a thumbs down? When it when it comes to how it interacts with the level up fighter, I think of <sighs> first is resource. If the subclass has a multiplicity of resources, I think that's going to I think that interacts posit positively with the level up play test. Because the level of play test is based on, hey, here's a bunch of resources that we have for you. And it's more than just a shorter long rest. You have a again, you have a multiplicity of them. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to map, it's easier to evaluate, it's easier to put into a matrix, whether that's mental or something that you actually drew out and started attaching number values to. You would be able to you would be able to evaluate whether or not it, it was a good fit or whether or not certain abilities need to be adjusted up or down. So I think that I think that's probably the biggest one. So I think Samurai is going to do fine, for instance. I think the Battlemaster is going to do fine. I think the uh, and and yeah, that's that's the biggest one. The other is theme as to whether or not if the theme happens to intersect with something that is already included in this playtest as of right now. Right. If you wanted to, if if you happen to have a slippery bastard mm -hmm. uh, fighter subclass, well, that would be perfect for mist and shade or whatever. You know, they that that would slot right into it. It would uh, half the work would already be done. So it's going to be, yeah. And it's, it, that all right? There it is. I I had to meander around a little bit to figure out the right wording for it. It is the subclasses in which half the work is already done by this playtest, or half the work is already done by the existing subclass. That's your best marker. All right, I can I can see that. Um, and that's not that's not a shade on the part of the devs because I think that they've already done half the work for a lot of different 
many, many different character archetypes, some of which they're probably not even aware of yet. They'll only discover them after people go through their second or third campaign with this material. I think they've done a fantastic job setting it uh, the groundwork, which they can then go back and evaluate later because it's so dynamic and say, okay, people have been combining things in this certain way, and now we get to, at the very least, you know, now we can include something for multi-classing fodder if we really want to, mm -hmm. because they've made a basic system in which multi-classing probably isn't going to be all that punishing, at least in comparison with 5e. Yeah. Now, it's time They gave themselves breathing space, is the conclusion I meant to come to at some point. Now, it's, it's time to bottom line this. What are your what are your guys's overall impressions of the first ten levels of the of this um take on the fighter? Xantrix, if you'd like to go first, I've been talking for ages. <laughs> I I enjoyed listening to your points. Um ultimately <clears throat> the way I see this is that they're trying to give fighter life essentially um as we've covered ad nauseum the base fighter in 5e is lacking it, 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 there aren't a lot of interesting things about it besides the battle master subclass and even then it's not necessarily a saving grace with what level up project has done they've taken fighter and flip that script entirely they're trying to not only in combat make it so that it's much more viable to continue to be fighter and not lag so far behind the caster classes that you fulfill the quadratic wizards linear fighter uh <laughs> trope uh, and at the time each tradition is made to also give flavor Make, make the fighter that you design your own. <clears throat> On top of that, they included uh, the exploration pillar and then, of course, the reputation and, and martial knowledge stuff uh, that isn't going to... You're not going to see a detriment if you don't use it. But if you do use it, it fleshes out the fighter even outside of the party, or outside of the combat part of the party. Uh, and makes them a rounder character overall. <clears throat> uh, I I don't have anything really negative to say about the intent and the and the direction they went, just some small issues here and there with certain aspects that could use reworking. Um a, again case in point being the the wounding attack maneuver from from the unending wheel uh, first degree maneuvers that we looked at mm -hmm. is is something small that catches your eye for the most part you look at the big picture and it's a really nice picture i like what they're doing with this yeah they were bound to miss at least once oh yeah it's it's gonna happen and, and that's why it's a play test and they're taking surveys and they're gonna be exploring further uh with the, with this uh, according to the website that i read um they just put up the playtest for Bard. Yeah, that was put, that was put up a a little bit ago, but that is. But we will not be covering the Bard next week. Um, what are we covering next week? Next week is we're it? covering the Rogue. Fair. Um, now, as far as far we got, as we gotta hit up that bar, we gotta hit up that yeah. bar though. Now, as as far oh, as my own as far as my own personal take on the on the fighter, um. I would I would say I would say that the some of the maneuvers definitely need a second go around. Um, I do I do th I do think that at the, that the the at the um, exploration nax and this and similar approaches is the is the real thing that's going to help bring life to this to this approach. Um, I'm fifty-fifty about the exertion pool. Um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what 
I'm a person. I'm on board with with the idea. It's more of how is it going to in, how is it going to interplay, especially at higher levels. That, but other than that, it's definitely a step in the right direction to making fighters actually not suck, or not ha not and break away from that whole standard fighter issue that I've had. But, like I said, next week we'll be tackling the rogue, and once once again it'll be tackling the first ten levels of the rogue class. Now, monk, you forgot to let Ash with his his closing thoughts there. I might. <laughs> Yeah, I might, I might as well close them off. Yeah, uh, I think that mechanically, in terms of combat, this is going to be a very interesting game that they develop. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a few pitfalls that they might fall into, which might make the game less favorable and less fun overall. But they have given themselves enough other mechanical options which don't fall into those pitfalls, which avoid them, don't even necessarily avoid them, they're on the other side of the planet, <laughs> that people will probably naturally adjust. Much like as I stopped using the magic weapon that uh, that made you do a con save or take 1d4 damage, eventually I think people will just stop using that maneuver, except they're not giving up using maneuvers in general, they're just going to switch it to something else. I think that the, the thing I am most attracted by no, I will I will save that for the end. I think that the exploration pillar is going to be a little bit underdeveloped because I think that they are still engaging with first draft iterations, many of which I have explained actually in the Chill Miss Valley discussion and in my discussions with uh, with other people about things like Rangers. I think they're engaging in first draft assumptions, which is that the players are going to spend food and therefore not starve, which is something that everybody throws out, because why would you engage in a resource mechanic which only ever makes you go down and avoid a negative instead of engage with a positive? But they are including other exploration acts, which, and this comes to my conclusion, they are very, very intent on reinforcing narrative with mechanics. And expanding the space of improvisation intertwined with mechanics inspired by the flavored text on your character sheet and probably within your origin story as well. I think that their their focus on that is going to turn this into a if not I think I think it's just going to be a solid game. It's going to be a based based on all I've seen so far, which is certainly not the entire game, and as we know. They could easily shoot themselves in the foot and get rid of half this stuff before before launch. I hope that they don't. I hope that they don't do what the 5e devs did because we already have 5th edition. We don't need a repeat of that. But I think they're just going to de deliver a mechanically solid game. It'll have some pitfalls. Those pitfalls, the game is big enough to avoid those pitfalls. And I think that they are putting such a focus on intertwining, improvisation, mechanics, and narrative, which are all engaged in a kind of, in many abilities, engaged in a feedback loop, mm. I think it it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine at worst. And it's going to be great at best. Alright. So with with all that in mind, I do want to get, I do want to once again thank both of you and um, and we'll, ha we'll have to bully Doku later for, be for being so late and gay that he didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll get and uh, and of course of course we'll be back here next week with the with the next iteration in this series I think this one and even though we went about as long as as last week this one ended up turning up a, a lot better because we focused on a on a different uh, format mm -hmm. and of and of course there's gonna be plenty of insanity as there always is here. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>